I am deeply moved, deeply touched, at a loss for words, because I don't think of myself in the terms that you express. I, I'm very much alive and doing things, and I, I don't react in, in terms of hearing about myself this way. It, it's a very difficult thing to sit there, and I almost listened as though I was listening to somebody talking about somebody I probably should know, but I didn't. <laughs> the, this award, I got a letter from Betty Chambers that told me I had won this award, and you have no idea, Betty, how shocked I was and how, how moved I was and how touched I was. And then something Ed Wilson said when we were in Dallas made sense to me. Ed Wilson came out of a meeting and he walked past and I was doing something and he said, Jerry, I voted for you. I didn't know what he voted for, but I said, that's nice, Ed, and because I expect him to vote for me, you know, yeah, he, we accept his, what he said, did in Dallas or something like that. And then it came to me, that's what he was talking about. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> the dedication of the book on positive humanism to Gina Allen, to Maxine Negri, and to Lee Roberts, came after my publisher, who's here, and I will introduce him to you in a moment, and I had talked about putting together some general talks that I had given to the Ethical Culture Society in Los Angeles, in New York, to certain humanist groups and so on. And as we went through, I keep manuscripts. I'm a manuscript type of person. I write things out. I'm not as skilled as Dr. Hardin who came up here and, and I don't know if he ever looked down, but what you said and your poise and your ability to convey uh, struck me about, made me feel inadequate, but I need a manuscript and that turned out to be a good thing, Dr. Hardin, because when we sat down to put this together, I had this pile of uh, statements and we managed to get two books out of it, uh, The Way of Positive Humanism, and I dedicated it to these three women because they represented the essence of positive humanism. Not negative humanism, but doing things that were positive in terms of feminism, in terms of the whole effort to make humanism uh, intelligent and sensible to the people in Los Angeles where Maxine works, and Lee with her creative skills in gold and silver and so on. These are aspects that we need to recognize. The other book, The Way of Ethical Humanism, I dedicated to Professor Joseph Blau. And I did that for a very definite reason. Joe Blau was an ethicist, professor, head of the Department of Religion at Columbia University. His last letter, the letter he was writing when he died, was to me. And it was a moving letter. His wife, Elner, sent it to me. It was something we had talked about. This man, in his, with all his background, his skill, his recognition as a scholar, was lonely and isolated. And he said, when I was with him in New York, can we set up a correspondence across the nation where I can share my ideas, criticize one another, and we can grow together. And that was what was in his mind. Now, my ethical understanding and growth and scholarship was not up to his. But what I have done here in this little book is recognize him for who he is and what he is. I will tell you, Betty and the board of the Humanist movement here, that uh, this honor has created a great deal of excitement in my life. Um, I was shocked by the letter. Then I got another letter telling me I was going to be a life member of the AHA, 
uh, which was another honor. These things start piling in. But then it spilled over into the university. I have a group of students who are pretty terrific people. I've got ex-students who wrote to me. One, a professor back in the Middle West, a professor of English, who will be, I think, producing some material that will be useful to humanists in the near future. One, a student who's now taking her doctorate in New Testament at the University of Chicago. She is a humanist. She's won one of our awards uh, with that Lloyd Moraine has set up for the humanist essay. She wrote under a pseudonym uh, to protect her father, who was a clergyman, but she is a humanist scholar, and she will be following in the footsteps of some of us who think that the humanist approach to New Testament might have something to say to our public. That's Lena Kasarjan. I have young students at the News Bureau who are my right arm. When anything comes in that they think would be interesting in the news, they come over to me and talk to me. And those of you who saw this thing out of the um, USA Today, uh, this was due to these two young students who phoned up and said, uh, what about these killings down in, Lubbock, or down in uh, uh, Texas and uh, uh, Mexico? What do you know about the Santa Rias? So we got into a conversation and I end up in USA Today. These people have, after I left, have put things in the news. I don't know what's happened. I know my classes know I'm getting this award. One of my students came in and saw again the Humanist magazine in the, ma in the library and announced to the class that this was going on, so I'll take the plaque to school. This is spread there. Then it hit the family. I have, I didn't tell this line of people in here that uh, my sister, Audrey, in Canada, who writes letters at four o'clock in the morning when she's in pain and can't sleep. And her husband, Bob, and their family have sent greetings. Uh, my one sister, who is in Hawaii right now before she has a cancer operation with her husband, uh, sent greetings from there. Their son, who's a professor at the University of Saskatchewan, was going to come down here and surprise me, but got caught up in university business and couldn't do it with his tribe. And my son, Jerry, uh, who was a assistant principal of a high school, was unable to come because he got caught in. Uh, my brother Paul was supposed to be here, but he isn't well. It's lousy things that happened to our family. But he did send my sister-in-law Eileen, and this is special for me because I married them many years ago up in Canada. Their beautiful daughter, Rhonda, my niece, their handsome son, Randy, my nephew, and his lovely wife, Val. Uh, these are very special people who have come here and are part of this uh, uh, evening. And then all the way from Puerto Rico, can you imagine this? All the way from Puerto Rico, my son David, who is a professor of geology and who is getting ready to drill a hole down in the middle of the earth and take a core a mile deep, David, uh, <laughs> if you can get past all the red tape. And uh, his very special um, friend, Leslie, are also here. She's from San Francisco, so you didn't have as far to come. So this is a very special evening for me in more ways than one. I have also an extended family here. Sherry Rupi, who's with Northwest Airlines, who comes and visits us whenever she's in Los Angeles. Ken Shea whose book you'll see out there proving that lay people can get in involved in biblical study and come up with interesting solutions to ancient problems is here. Um, we have, uh, let's see, who else? Oh yes, we have the Farbmans from uh, Ethical Culture. Paul Farbman is the president of Ethical Culture and his wife Carrie is here and that little baby you see wandering around is Steve. Uh, I had the pleasure of marrying those two, they're collapsed on the floor back there, and of having the na naming ceremony for their baby some time ago. Then we have the person who does the artwork on my books, uh, Penny, well she's 
doesn't go by Penny when she does this, but her real, we call her Penny Alexander, and she brought her husband along, David Alexander, who is the publisher of not only this book, but the one by Ed Dorr uh, on the abortion uh, situation. So this is a very special evening, a gathering of people who are meaning, have deep meaning to me, not only you humanists who I've come to know and care about, but these people who I see all the time. And finally, and most important, no, I didn't forget you, Emily. <laughs> My wife, who uh, just received the uh, wonderful plaque and uh, who looks after me and has given me more happiness than I can tell you. I want to thank you for being here, all of you. My subject tonight is titled Gerald Ethics, a Humanist Issue. Gerald Ethics is a word I've coined. I think gerontological ethics is a little awkward. And Gerald Ethics is concerned with ethical issues as they affect the older members of our society, of our world society. These elders, as I prefer to call them, have survived the dramatic social and technological and psychological and social changes that have taken place during the past 100 years. Changes that have been recognized as the most profound and the most significant that have, of any that have occurred in the long evolutionary history of humankind. These elders were born during the first 25 years or so of this century, and they're now 65 years of age or older. Now, my, em my ethical emphasis will not focus on geriatric or medical ethics. That's something I am vo I'm avoiding tonight. But on that which contributes to individual dignity, to feelings of self-worth, to the sense of control over one's life, to the recognition of personhood, and so forth. And ultimately, what I'm saying tonight will be expanded into a book uh, that I hope to get done by the end of the year. Ethics are to be distinguished from morals. Morals reflect codified rules of behavior, rules established by human communities, and often ascribed to one deity or another, thereby providing supernatural authority for any given code. The regulations reflect attitudes toward marriage, sexual behavior, communal rights, and so forth. Ethics which may include or involve moral rules are concerned with the broader principles of justice, of fair play, of decency, of respect, and so forth. Ethics reflect values, and they testify to what the individual, or the group, or the society values most. Present gerontological research tends to emphasize political, scientific, technological, and medical issues, all of which are important, and I'm associated with one of the great gerontological research centers of the world, the Andrus Center. Humanistic dimensions, however, become secondary, and ethical concerns are moved toward the fringe. The focus is on the classification of ailments, the standing of elders as a group or a category in our society, on demography, on statistics, on what the elders cost our society, when personhood is considered, the discussion is generally related to terminal illness. Individual worth thereby is minimized, and consequently, elders as persons are devalued. There are well-known ethical codes. Perhaps the most familiar in our society is the Decalogue. The commandments are presented in what is called apodictic form. That is, they state what must be done or what must not be done in absolute terms. Thou shalt 
honor thy father and thy mother. There is no room for challenge to this formula. There is no provision for debate. One cannot say, but wait a minute. What about this particular instance where the parents have brutalized the children? Must one still honor such parents? Later, another generation, a New Testament generation, may add to this, fathers, do not provoke your children. But no guidance is given for situations where moral rules are disobeyed or ignored. The rules are set. They present what the humanist ethicist Joseph Fletcher has identified as rule book ethics. They provide hard and fast legalistic prescriptions for determining what is right and proper in all situations. Fletcher's situation ethics provide flexible alternatives. They acknowledge circumstances involved in particular instances. Situation ethics weigh the varying aspects of a given situation, a given setting, and seek to arrive at a just conclusion. Such ethics tend to be less harsh, less dogmatic, more flexible, more humane. Perhaps one should honor their parents, but as we all know, some elders make it very difficult to honor them. They're hard to live with, they're hard to love, they may be impossible to like. In other words, as we begin to consider Jarrow ethics, we need to keep in mind certain basic concerns, and I'd like to present a few of these to you tonight. First is this, each elder, and some of these are so obvious, each elder brings to any environment a unique background, and you would say, of course. Each carries with him or her what was experienced, how the experience was experienced, what the experience did to them or for them how the experience helped them or hurt them. Each brings his or her own biases, prejudgments, dogmas, and distortions. Each brings unique qualities of spirit and of coping and of temperament. For better or for worse, each elder affects the total environment. Some are easy to be with. They fit nicely and easily into almost any situation. Others are just the opposite. They bring toxic influence into almost any setting. What we cannot know is what each carries within in terms of inner conflicts that were never resolved, terrible damage that was never repaired, psychological wounds that were never treated, Without knowledge of these internal burdens, these persons cannot be understood. Now let me illustrate what I'm talking about. Suddenly, at 60 years of age, after 42 years of marriage, she became a widow. After the funeral, she went into sudden decline. She could not walk. She got about in a wheelchair she seemed unable to concentrate or carry out the most ordinary tasks. She became a helpless burden to everyone. Medical examination found absolutely nothing physically wrong with her. And then a social worker asked the right question. This woman who had moved so graciously, so confidently in social circles, had never been allowed to mature or take care of herself. She had never learned to drive a car. Her husband had taken her everywhere, or because he could afford it, arranged for her transportation. She had never learned anything about family finances. Indeed, she didn't even know how to write a check or balance a checkbook. She had always had charge accounts or credit cards. Her husband had looked after such details. 
Suddenly she was alone and helpless. And since the time when she was 18 years of age, she had been, in his words, taken care of and never allowed to grow up. So the social worker took her in hand. Today she drives her own car, she handles family finances, and is more poised and at ease socially than she ever was during her 42 years of marriage. This helpless, wheelchair-bound woman has emerged as a person. No one knew the insecurity, the feelings of inadequacy she carried within. And therefore, no one could understand her demanding childlike dependency and her sudden helplessness. She began to sculpt. Her work was outstanding. And her instructors said, we must have a showing of this work. She quit sculpting. She became a museum docent. She was so inspiring, so knowledgeable, that they invited her to become a teacher of docents. She left the museum. She wrote a magnificent article and was persuaded to, pre to submit it for publication. She sent it to a prestigious, learned journal. The editor was impressed, but it did not fit in with their interests. He sent it back and suggested two other publications that he felt would be pleased to have it. She never tried again. She attempted suicide. Why? What no one knew was that as a child, she had been sexually molested by her brother. And he had boasted of his exploits to his playmates, who would follow her home from school, asking to experiment with her. Her mother was a miserable, unhappy tyrant who debased her daughter and made her a menial. I won't go into the details of that. They're frightening. When she matured and met and married the young doctor, he was her knight in shining armor who had rescued her from a terrible life. But deep within, she carried the pain and the shame, the memory of those horrible experiences. She knew inside that she was what she had been called, a soiled, dirty little girl. If any of her associates discovered her true nature, they'd despise her, mock her, reject her. She could not accept herself for what she truly was, a talented, gifted artist, a good mother, a fine wife, a socially desirable companion, a victim of molestation, a victim of cruel upbringing, and consequently, a woman deeply and unexplainably depressed at times. So she attempted suicide. Each elder carries within the burdens, the failures, and the triumphs of the past. Some have been helped to cope with life-destroying experiences. Others have within wounds that bleed and drain energy. We do not come to our old age unburdened. We bring our past with us. And the ethical principle I am stressing can be put in the form of an old Indian saying that you all know. Do not judge another until you have walked a mile in his moccasins. Back of our behavior experience, experiences are, our behavior patterns are experiences that have helped to shape us into what we have become. To understand the elder, it is important to know where he has been or where she has been, what has happened in that life, and how the happenings have been handled. That's the first point. The second is this. We have entered a no-deposit no return era. Whatever may be classified as used or worn out or non-functional or viewed as useless can be and should be replaced or cast into the discard. There are those who would place the feeble elderly in such a category. Among the voices 
the general voices heard reflecting this sort of an attitude is that of Governor Lamb, ex-Governor Lamb of Colorado. He is said to have suggested that the elderly need to get out of the way and make room for upcoming youth. His comments could be interpreted as heraldic, giving warning of the shape of things to come. Indeed, the problem may be already upon us since many of our elders have become numbered among the untouchables. There are elders who for one reason or another have fallen between the cracks in our social service and mental health programs. They may be alone. They may be without living family or without, at least without anyone who cares about them in particular. Their need for care and for caretakers is desperate. They may be frail and chronically ill or disturbed or abusive or given to over consumption of alcohol or drugs. They may hallucinate or they may not be sure where they are in time and space. They may be difficult, cantankerous, but they need help. What can be done with them? Why, how can they be cared for? It is common knowledge that our welfare programs are underfunded. Some elder care homes willing to accept these social misfits are understaffed, unsanitary, and simply disgusting. Many institutions simply will not admit them because they do not have the facilities necessary for proper care and oversight. Nor can the supervisory responsibilities of the various cities and counties and states provide proper and regular inspection of centers. As a consequence, there are elders who have been placed in board and care facilities and left to the mercies of the operators. The case reported in Sacramento in November 1988, where seven elderly people were murdered for their social security checks by the operator of an elder care center reflects several dimensions of our time and our era. First, the supervisory personnel who should have been in touch with what was taking place in that home are overworked and tend not to investigate, but to believe everything is moving smoothly unless there are a number of complaints. Second, the, because the placement of the frail elderly needing special care is so very difficult, there is a tendency for social workers to accept whatever is available and to hope that all is well. Third, those not directly affected by these troubled and needy elders prefer not to become involved. The presence of these social outcasts reflects our inability to provide adequate care, which in turn testifies to our society's lack of genuine social concern. We don't like the spotlight to be focused on our failures. The alternative is to turn away, to shun, to avoid, and to protect our unconcern by the argument of lack of knowledge we didn't know. When individual cases are made known through the public media, the response is often overwhelming, pointing up the generous and caring nature of the American people. But because the plight of the elderly is so broad and so unfocused, the safest response for society in general is to distance itself from the situation. Efforts to help become the responsibility of a small band of dedicated caregivers in mental health, social service and welfare departments augmented by the police officers. These are the people who take care of our untouchables, among whom are the needy elders. Now there are distinct and well-known dangers in the principle of coping with societal problems by distancing. The untouchables of India were the product of a caste system. They were not ignored. 
They were part of a structure of society. They had their place within that society. This aspect of untouchability is not my focus. Our untouchables have no status within our society. And if we extend the no deposit, no return philosophy, which we have applied to certain artifacts to include humans, then the treatment of the frail and feeble elders can move toward a way of thinking that dominated Central Europe some 40 years ago. I refer to Nazi Germany. There a progression in identification emerged. The first untouchables were the mentally impaired. It was argued since they made no contribution to society, they were therefore disposable. They could not defend themselves and the voices of those who would defend them were not heard. Then the classification of disposables, disposable humans, was expanded. And ultimately, it included the feeble elderly. Then the gypsies. Then the Jews. Then any other group that could be isolated and so labeled. The feeble and impaired elderly are our untouchables. We ignore them as if we wish they would go away. We fail to provide adequate funds for their care, and when horror stories emerge, we are shocked. Our humanistic, ethical principle should exceed by far that which operates or operated in the Indian caste system or in the German Aryan conspiracy. Now, in another context, I have pointed out that as far back as we can go in our human literature, there is clear evidence of the impatience of youth with elders who seem to hold on to positions of authority and power and control. Youth always perceives itself as moving into new social and historical dimensions, sometimes not recognizing that the new frontiers are always a heritage from the previous generation. In this century, our innovations include new music, new machines, new means of communication, and so forth. Our grandchildren grow up with computers in their schools, and in some instances in their homes, just as their elders grew up with radios and television that had not been part of their parents' childhood. My father, who was given to maxims, often said, maybe yours did too, young people believe that they have forgotten more than their elders ever knew. Did you ever hear that one? Then as I matured and moved toward middle age and perhaps I settled down a bit and our ideas merged a little bit, he commented that I should be pleased to have discovered how much he had learned during the past few years. There's an ironic twist to him. Demographic studies inform us that because family size has greatly diminished during the past century. By the time the baby boomers enter old age, there will not be a solid base of young wage earners and taxpayers to meet the pension needs, social security costs, health costs, and so on. You've all heard this. These observations point to an ethical dilemma related to the significance of human life, to the significant significance of the lives of the elders who have made vital contributions to the continuation and growth of this nation and of this world. By their very existence, each elder has contributed to our world and to our society. It really does not matter whether that contribution was made in the context of some high-sounding, high-paying labor. For instance, contributions to health and well-being include far more than the work of doctors and nurses or the research that will produce the new antibiotic to ward off a fatal disease. Health services include the provision of clean working environments which require clean floors, dusted furnishings, the gathering and disposal of garbage and other wastes, flushing our streets, the provision of clean dishes, clean clothes, clean uniforms, 
all contribute to sanitation and health. And if you don't believe that, just think back when the garbage strike hit, strike hit New York and the garbage began to pile up in the streets and the rats came out. It didn't matter whether you were a doctor or not. What mattered was whether you were a trash collector. These were the people that were responsible for our health in that situation. What I'm saying is that every person, every inhabitant, makes some contribution. Each person, no matter how menial his or her service, or how lowly his or her social status, or how, how limited his or her formal education, has made some contribution to bring the world to the point at which it is now. And by virtue of that contribution, by virtue of simply having been here and being alive, he or she has earned the right to grow old, to age with dignity and with security. By their very being, the elders have earned the right to a dignified old age and to the protection of health and well-being. To deny the elders the food, the housing, the health care they need is to deny our humanity its fullest expression. And the ethical principle I'm talking about is a simple one. It is a humanistic concept that is found in all of the major religious faiths. It is simply this, that you treat each person as a priceless, one-of-a-kind being, never to be replicated in all of human history, unique with a personal DNA structure, with a peculiar, unique genetic heritage, with experiences and interpretations of experiences that belong only to him or to her. A living, rare library of thoughts, emotions, and concepts. Now, it is true that some of these rare living libraries are rather tattered around the edges. Time and life does that, or do that to humans. And that some hold some very ugly and disheartening records of human behavior and attitudes. These two are part of our human story. They belong to all of us. These, there are always among us those who must be sheltered or locked away for their own and for others' safety. I'm not trying to glamorize humanity. My ethical principle is a general one. Each person is unique and precious and deserves to be treated as such. My third point is related to the last and is concerned with the meaning of life. It's a question that confronts every thoughtful person, every thinker who is not willing to accept dogma simply because it is told to him or to her. We find meaning in different ways. If one is a part of an extended family with significant bonding pat patterns, meaning may be found in familial relationships. A mother finds meaning in being the best mother she can be, a father in being the best father he can be, a son in being the best son and brother and later father that he can be, and a daughter in fulfilling her role as a daughter, sister, then mother in her own family. Some find meaning in their work, in what they do. I've been with engineers and with carpenters and with bricklayers who point with pride to what they have brought into being, whether it be a high-rise structure, a piece of home furniture, or one of these sound walls along the side of the freeway. I've also been with the seamstress and the gardener and the homemaker and the cook, all of whom delight in what he or she has created. Some find meaning in a faith system. They believe in an afterlife where they will be rewarded for what they have done in this life, or they believe in the reincarnation uh, or transmigration of souls, and their life is given meaning and direction through their faith system. But sometimes what we count on to bring meaning undergoes change. Some become so enmeshed in their work that when their working days cease, they do not know how to retire. I could be accused of that, I suppose. Some, however, retreat into senility and out of boredom because they find that they have outlived their usefulness and their significance, and they are sad people indeed. We're in a migratory age. 
Families separate and move to different parts of the world. They return to the, fest the central nest only on festival occasions or they come from Puerto Rico when their father gets a humanist award. <laughs> Sometimes when they return, the old intimacy is gone. Not with us, of course. But and those who thought of growing old with their families around them can feel abandoned. And should the spouse die, the remaining individual may be suddenly and completely alone. And this is another study that is worth looking into. Isolation induces feelings of estrangement. Estrangement means distancing from others, a withdrawal into the self. Withdrawal into the self places one among the untouchables, the unlovables, the discards that have no meaning or life, for life or in life. The feeling response is helplessness and uselessness, and the results are the withdrawal from life toward death, as Seligman has indicated in his wonderful study on helplessness. The ethical principle here is not too different from that in my first point. We all need to belong, to feel important, to know that we are significant, that we matter in the human family. And because so many are so hungry for recognition as human beings, it takes so very little effort for any one of us, any one of us humanists, to speak a word of greeting, to tell someone that they look nice when they do, of course, to comp compliment someone for an effort made. I'm not suggesting a Pollyanna little glad girl role. I don't know if you remember Pollyanna. was the little girl who went around trying to make everyone glad. If someone had water on the knee, she told them to be glad that it wasn't water on the brain, and so on. The ethical principle I'm wrestling with here calls for the recognition of another's personhood. Or, in the words of the telephone company, reach out and touch someone. My fourth point is this. Aging is often accompanied by feelings of helplessness, as I said, and also vulnerability. The body has lost some of its vigor. One tires more easily. The requirements of doing business in the modern world seem to have become more complex and more confusing. Sometimes a bill is overlooked and the utility company threatens to terminate service. The bank statement is late and this is a disquieting factor. There's a pipe leak and although this is something that the man would have fixed very easily in the past, he's now called upon to ask for the help of a plumber. And the plumber's charges are not what they were 25 years ago. And sometimes the elder believes he or she is being overcharged, and of course sometimes the elder is overcharged. A recent expose of a Southern California religious leaders taking advantage of the elderly members of his parish prompted this statement from one of the investigators. There are two vulnerable groups, little children and the elderly. Little children have no money, so this man went after the elderly. The elderly women who loaned money to this pastor were interviewed for television news. They looked and they acted vulnerable. They had a need to trust someone. They trusted the wrong person and their small savings accounts are forever gone. Some elders have falls or tumbles. They become unsure of their ability to maneuver and, they, and get around. They begin to limit their activities. The world shrinks. And confinement and lack of motion has the effect of freezing the limbs and immobilizing the muscles. They become more helpless. Within a nursing home, an adequately equipped nursing home or retirement center, such problems may be minimized. Security is provided. And there are opportunities to remain mobile. What there may not be until legislation is passed is the kind of security that will prevent greedy relatives or others from taking financial advantage of the elderly person's need for friendship and the elderly person's feelings of helplessness. And the ethical principle again is this. Elders have earned the right to security by being here and by doing what they have done. 
They deserve and they need protection from these vulturous predators who are always ready to take advantage of them. And when their world begins to crumble, they need to be assured that the crumbling is at the edges and that the center remains firm, who they are and what they are. And that with caring people to help, they can come through on their own just as they have always done. Most elderly people need to be reminded that they are survivors. And as survivors, they have a right to security. This is my fifth point, and perhaps it overlaps again with what I've said before. And it deals with prejudice against the elderly. Like all prejudices, the prejudgments are irrational. They deal with stereotypes, with mental images of elders that are automatically read into the character of or life of older people. Such prejudices are reflected in some, but fortunately not all, of our sitcoms and movies. You know, the elderly need to be shouted at. They hobble around. They're funny, odd people. If they are older men of substance, they make bad marriages with greedy younger women. And if they are older women of substance, they're made fools of by some gigolo aboard a cruise ship. And if they're employed to advertise a product, the elder is made to represent some silly old woman who tells his mother knows best. It's terrible, the image that is projected. How many of you saw the wonderful movie Harold and Maude? Everybody should see that. There we had reflected the problem of image. Here's the story. Maude, an 80-year-old elder, was in spirit and in outlook much younger and far more alive than the teenaged Harold. And Harold fell in love with this wonderful, zany old lady, and he wanted to marry her. His concerned mother subjected him to a series of advisors. One of these counselors was the priest, and this man, with his face twisted with disgust, described Maud as a woman possessing a wrinkled body with withered dugs. In this man's eyes, she was ugly because she was old. His description reflected the attitude of many. What he ignored was the beauty of Maud's personality, which young Harold recognized and loved. In addition, it might be observed that this priest was inadequately educated about the anatomy of aging. A wrinkled countenance does not signify withered breasts. Uh, I'm not going to say I speak as an expert. Well, I... <laughs> we need public recognition of the beauty of old age. It is not the, self, the soft, fresh beauty of this baby back here, this infant. It is not the beauty of the teenager or the 20-year-old or the 30-year-old or the 40-year-old. Each age has its own beauty, and the beauty of the older person deserves recognition for what it is. It calls for awareness of both inner and outer beauty and of appreciation of the total, not just the physical person. The ethical principle, again, requires cognizance and sensitivity to the totality of the individual so that we do not judge merely on the basis of age. The sixth point, and then there's one more. During the second part of this century, there has been a growing apprehension, a growing awareness of the fact that many of us are violent people. Whether this violence can be traced to nature or to nurture or a combination of both can be debated. During the 1960s, our consciousness was raised concerning spouse abuse. Protective laws were passed and places of refuge were established to protect abused women and their children. During the 1970s, the depth and scope of child abuse surfaced, and the horror stories that came to light resulted in laws and agencies to protect children. The 1980s turned the social spotlight on elder abuse. Much of the attention focused on what happened in some poorly managed nursing homes where helpless victims were severely abused. 
less emphasis was placed on familial abuse where children and relatives have chained, beaten, starved, raped, and a variety and a variety of ways physically mal maltreated elders. In addition, there has been financial abuse and psychological abuse. Recently, I conducted a course on the recognition of, uh, of and reporting of and treatment of elder abuse for the Los Angeles County Department of Adult Services. Every person who works with older people should be aware of what the abuse entails, how it affects the psyche of the elderly person, and what can be done to help both the abuser and the abused. The ethical issue I am associated, or what I'm trying to say is this. No one, and I mean no one, has the right to abuse another, verbally, psychologically, physically, financially. Whether the abuse is done in the name of religion, or some school of psychology, or in the name of education. Where it is clear that one person may injure himself or another person, restraints may be necessary, but not abuse. And this brings me to the second facet of this ethical issue. No one should have to undergo or experience abuse at the hands of another. Should violation of another occur, that violation should be reported to proper authorities by anyone who has knowledge of the situation. And until we commit ourselves to a no-tolerance mindset concerning elder abuse, or indeed any abuse, abuse will continue unchecked. And by virtue of our silence, we will be guilty of helping it to remain. My final point is this. Thanks to the marvelous progress in modern medicine, we live longer and better lives than ever before in history. At the turn of the century, the anticipated lifespan was 47 years. Today, it's in the 70s. In the past, childhood diseases, including whooping cough, diphtheria, measles, scarlet fever, infantile paralysis, tuberculosis, and so on, ravaged families. Today, these diseases are really rarely heard of. They're relatively under control. New surgical techniques have introduced organ transplants, which coupled with bioengineering have served to extend life. However, the extension of life does not always ensure meaningful and dignified existence. Some who have contracted incur incurable diseases, such as certain forms of cancer, have been kept alive against their will by machines and tubal feeding and medication. Some in extreme pain have pleaded for death. The emotional, the physical, the psychological, the financial stress on the patient, the family, and the medical facilities can be excessive. The development of the hospice concept has provided aid for the terminally ill and their families. Hospice workers, these wonderful individuals, consult with, meet with, work with patients and with their families. They counsel, they support, they provide respite care. Pain control under the management of the patient enables some to remain at home. In other instances where hospice centers are available, a patient may be cared for in a relaxed atmosphere where no effort is being made to cure the disease, which is acceptably uncurable and terminal, but every effort is made to provide an environment for a dignified death with the minimum amount of, suf minimum, minimum amount of suffering and pain. The development of the living will, which has legal acceptance now in some 37 states, provides the opportunity to express personal wishes for treatment should a person become incapacitated with a terminal illness. The will executed and witnessed while the person is sound of mind and body can provide for the removal of the life support systems should the person be afflicted with a terminal disease and in intractable pain. A second document called the, power, the Durable Power of Attorney for Health Care provides that should a person be so incapacitated that he or she cannot make his or her wishes known, 
perhaps due to having entered into a coma state, the assigned person may make health care decisions on behalf of the patient. The living will and the durable power of attorney for health care provide for the cessation of what we have called heroic means of treatment when such treatment promises no hope for recovery. The patient is then permitted to die. This form of euthanasia, popularly known as passive euthanasia, has general support from the public and religious and medical groups. However, as we learned in the Karen Ann Quinlan case, the cessation of heroic efforts to sustain life by machines, when these machines are removed, does not necessarily bring death. A patient in coma with the reasoning areas of the brain destroyed may continue to live for years, sustained only by a feeding tube. Patients in intractable pain who are not on life support systems and who have only a short time to live may cry out for surcease. Under our present laws, lethal medication may not be administered by a physician or a friend or a relative without subjecting the doctor or the friend or the relative to the possibility of prosecution for homicide. Let me illustrate. Several years ago, I received a phone call from a university professor in Canada. Her mother was in agony in the final stages of cancer. Medications left her groggy and confused and only partially controlled the pain. She begged her daughter to do something to help her die. And the daughter phoned and asked me, what can I do? Now, how can I advise someone whom I've never met and who lives a thousand miles away? So I took down the data and I said to her, talk to your doctor. The next few days were very troublesome ones for me as I sweated this thing through, thinking it through, wrestling with it in my mind. And because I had obtained the phone number of the hospital room, I dialed and the daughter answered. And she said, oh, Dr. LaRue, I'm so glad you phoned. I have just given my mother the lethal injection. And I went, <sighs> like this. She told me, I said, well, what happened? She said, well, I did what you told me. I love these kind of simple answers. Um, she spoke to her doctor and she said, this morning the doctor came down the hall, he put a syringe in my hand and he said, I never want to talk to you again about this. She and her mother said their last farewells expressed their love for each other and her mother told her how grateful she was for what she was doing and then she injected the medication and her mother died relaxed and she said with that little smile on her face that I haven't seen for years or for weeks about 15 months later she was in California she was on her way to Mexico to where she was going to read a paper and she stopped off to see me and she told me about the experience again. And I was concerned with what kind of guilt do you feel? She experienced no guilt over ending her mother's life. Her act was an act of love and it was in compliance with her mother's wishes. Of course she could have been prosecuted, but she wasn't because no one knew of it. More recently, I have been receiving phone calls from young men facing death through AIDS. Some of these people are, a couple of them are men I met when I was in San Diego, way back with the Tim LaHaye debate. And they phoned, and they're stockpiling medication, which they will ingest when they feel that the quality of life has degenerated to the degree that existence is meaningless and intolerable. Control of life, control of death. Now, I don't know what the future holds, but perhaps the subgroup of the National Hemlock Society called Americans Against Human Suffering will be able to get enough signatures so that when the next elections roll around, they will be able to get the Humane and Dignified Death Act on the ballot. And should the act pass, then active euthanasia performed at the patient's request by the medical profession will be legalized here in California, perhaps also in Oregon and in Washington. I know that some of you humanists were among those who gave time and energy to collecting signatures during this last election in California. 
The next time around, the plan is that the work of volunteers will be supplemented by professionals who are the people who really get the signatures, apparently, because that's all they do and they're paid for it. The issue of voluntary active euthanasia is an important ethical issue in gerontology. Most elders are healthy and well. Most die peaceful deaths. But for the minority that do not, it's important that they have control over their own death. Now, this gerontological list of ethical issues could be extended, and as I said, I will continue to pursue this statement, this, this subject, and make more statements in the future. For the now, let me conclude with a broad humanist ethical principle that forms the basis for all geroethical concerns. It is this, that we, particularly we as humanists, live life so as to encourage in each and every human being, including the self, that which develops and brings forth the highest and noblest behavior and responses to life, thereby enabling each person, including the self, to maximize the life potential. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the humanist way. Thank you. Good.